Hello, everybody. Welcome to another awesome episode of the Weld Preservation Podcast. As always, I'm with my co-host, Mark Scyther. Mark, how's it going today? Doing great. Uh, we, we got a light dusting of snow outside. Uh, it's pretty outside. Everything's awesome. Uh, weather's cold. I love cold weather. So it's just a great day all around. Absolutely. This is the second half. This is the second half of the start of 2022. So, you know, new year, new us. We're excited. I am going to stick to all of my goals this year. I didn't yeah, set any, but I'm going to stick to them. Yeah. Yes. I'm not going to lose any weight like I have every other year. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, well, hey, uh, today I'm excited about episode two with John Rubino of JID Investments. And we are going to be talking a little bit more. If you, if you didn't catch the first episode, we, uh, we dove into his background as an entrepreneur and how he invested his, uh, uh, his uh, uh, firm and, and everything he does there. And today we're going to learn a little bit more about like kind of the, the meat to what he does. Right, so we're going to yeah. learn the ins and outs of it, how he has that vision for certain deals, um, and, and just uh, how how investors go through his process. So, uh, yeah, yeah, John, th- thank for being on again. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so we're excited for all of our real estate investing nerds. I mean, you know, this is your chance to if you want to hear how deals get done, and you know how GID puts those together, and how they come up with deal flow and things like that. This is it. I mean, you're hearing it from a guy that does it does it for a living and started from scratch. So, uh, <laughs> you know, start taking notes. And if you're not a real estate nerd, you can listen to our first episode about how John was playing Nintendo and his buddy yeah. took him aside and taught him about yeah. real estate. And now this is what he does. So I, I, I used to play Nintendo. Nobody took me aside. And now I interview John. That's how that yeah. works, right? I used to be <laughs> yeah. the greatest tech mobile player in the world before real estate came. Dude, the Bo Jackson on the sweep was oh just my God, the unstoppable. Best. <laughs> unstoppable. Bo Jackson on the sweep and tech mobile. <laughs> awesome. Yes, sir. Uh, well, awesome. Well, so first, uh, can you give uh, everyone a quick rundown of JID Investments, uh, what you guys do specifically, and where you operate out of? Absolutely. So we are a, uh, a kind of a, an investment firm. We're, we're an investment firm that invests on passive real estate uh, opportunities that are uh, residential, mixed use, a little bit of commercial. And our goal really is to partner with sponsors and developers and investors who are actively operating, buying, purchasing, acquiring, selling, managing property. And we partner with them and we help provide uh, general equity to their capital stack for projects they have um, on a deal by deal basis. And so for the sponsors, we want to partner with folks that are in the Washington, D.C., Maryland, Virginia markets and submarkets, as well as markets in the southeast, all the way down to Florida. And I was far west, let's say, to where you, uh, where no, Josh is in down in Tennessee. And that's kind of our kind of focus area. We like those markets. We've done deals in those markets. We're comfortable with those markets. And in a perfect world, those are the types of developers that are in those markets we want to work with. These folks have been doing this for a while. They're experienced. Um, we spend time when we first meet these folks, getting to know them, their business, their culture, their process. We want to collect information on them. We want to get some references, their banks they've worked with, look at a few full cycle deals, go and meet them in person, walk some of their property. So yeah, we spend a lot of time with them at first to get to know them. And then once we kind of feel in a good position where they know what we do and how we can help them with equity and our terms, our parameters, how we work, and we know that we can add value to them, we're a good fit for them, we start looking at their projects for investment. On the other side of the coin for the business is that we have uh, investors who are individuals, uh, friends and family, credit investors, uh, people that utilize our self-directed IRAs, people that are using capital gains to invest in opportunity zones, which we'll talk about. But these are folks that... Um, or accredited investors or sophisticated investors who are very close friends and family that are basically in a position to see our deals and be uh, in an opportunity and be in a position to invest if they like the opportunities we bring forward. So um, it's kind of a bringing the sponsor to the investor, right? The source of the money and bringing them together so that we can help raise the money and also provide fantastic returns for our investors. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Happy to get into those details, but that's really the two lines of effort for our business. Yeah. So, so real quick for our listeners. So are you like a syndicator or kind of? That's right. We're a syndication company. We're a passive syndication company in the sense that 
the investors aren't directly investing into the opportunities from the sponsors, nor are the sponsors dealing directly with the investors. We're kind of like the facilitator and liaison. Gotcha. Gotcha. So you guys basically go out and source deals, do the due diligence, and then give provide a vehicle for people to go out and, and invest. That's correct. That's what we which, do. Yep. Which is a great service because people don't, you know, you don't want to have to go out and do your own personal due diligence on a thousand different investments because it'll you'll you'll die before you make an investment. Right. And and we kind of hold their hands through the process, but at the same time we do have every one of our investors is very smart and intelligent on looking at things, so they do go sure. off and do their own due diligence, but in my my perfect deal would be to get them something on a silver platter where they feel confident about it. They know about it. They can go off and do their due diligence, ask us questions, and use us as the uh, conduit to get everything they need to feel comfortable. Yeah. And never be in a position to be obligated to invest. So, like, we've had investors that have taken us all the way through the 11th hour and said, you know what? I just don't feel comfortable. And that's fine. That's yeah. fine. Sure. Gotcha. Awesome. Okay. Sweet. So, for those of you in the, that are listening that want to know what syndicate, syndicate syndicators are, that's kind of that in a nutshell is uh, mm-hmm. take care of the the hard due diligence for you or give you a, a better facility to go out and, you know, help you do the due diligence better, at least point you in the right direction. It's very yep. cool. You don't have to become an extreme real estate nerd before you start investing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot, a lot of our investors are business owners, people that have a, you know, let's say a six to five or nine to five job and, and um, they don't have the time every day to do this where we're doing this as for a living. They yeah. are in their pajamas on a weekend and, and drip, drinking their coffee and they're on their portal looking at their investments with us and they can call us anytime if they have questions and, you know, we're always available to help them. So, yeah. So, why, why did you come into uh, to this part of the business instead of doing the development side? You, you kind of found this, uh, you know, because there's multiple level, you know, multiple different ways you can do, you know, do real estate. So why yeah. did how, how this kind of come about? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, you know, the uh, the, the developers are guaranteeing significant size sizes of, of capital. Uh, the debt usually on the banks for these deals could be anywhere from you know twenty to a hundred plus million dollars. Sure. And so, to personally guarantee that, have that risk, and to be honest, you know, I feel like I'm better suited for what I'm doing now rather than sure. being a developer. I mean, maybe one day I will go out and try to be a developer or be an active investor, but I just don't want to deal with that, those headaches and those, and, yeah. those and like I said in the last episode, you know, I'm better at this than, right. than those things, even though I know how those things operate because I have to, I have to understand that to, to, I can explain to my investors and, and go through that process, but I don't want to, you know, I just choose not to do that. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. So real quick, just a more background. So how'd you get started yeah. build, in real estate? What was kind of like your first real estate deal, right? Quote unquote deal. What was that? So actively, it was back in 2005, like I said in the last episode, I uh, found a new construction home builder right around the corner from where I lived down in Southern Maryland. And um, basically, it was a $1,000 refundable investment to kind of hook up with the builder and through the real estate uh, broker who was handling it and basically built a new home. And they built the house on a piece of land. I picked out everything and it was about a $280,000 investment between the build of the home and I went down to the showroom and picked everything out. And um, basically the way it worked, it was a construction to permanent financing loan. So basically the builder would get all the money they needed from the construction loan that was in their name, wasn't even in my name. And then once the property was done, they would turn the property over to me and I would take over the financing on the property as the, uh, as the primary resident owner. But before I bought the home, about a week before I started showing it, bringing in people that were interested in buying it. And I was listing it for, you know, $350, dollars sure. and um, was able to get a, a buyer. So I basically did what's called a double closing. I closed and then I closed right to the turnkey buyer. Everything went to the requirements on the construction loan piece, the builder got paid back. And then anything that was left over was mine for profit, which was about nice. $60,000. So that was awesome. Yeah. And I did that a couple of times. And then uh, and then I started investing passively. I started investing through companies that, uh, like, for my example, the investor went directly to the sponsor. And, you know, these are smaller projects. You have two, three condo units, uh, you know, development, conversion. And I invested about $200,000 of my own money. And I was getting about a 10% return over a seven, eight-year period. So every year, 10%, 10%, 10%. And um, I was loving it. I was going in and doing all the due diligence on these projects. I was 
getting to learn about them. I was getting a better understanding of how things were operating. But again, passively, it wasn't sure. day to day. Matter of fact, I was overseas for three years for the first three years in Italy, when I was stationed there. But I, I built that knowledge and that skill set. And when I moved back to DC back in 2012, that was the premise of my business model of what JID Investments is. So that's kind of what got me going. And then I basically took that model where I said, okay, I know these people now that are doing this and I'm going to meet more people. Why don't I grow a nice group of good people that I could help, you know, make money for. Let me do it at a manageable level. A lot of these uh, projects, you know, we have investors come in at around a 25 to $50,000 minimum, which is very manageable. Um, Some of these syndication companies require a minimum of a hundred thousand or 200,000 or 300,000. And you can come in at twenty five to fifty thousand, depending on what we set up for that investment, and you can be an owner as as a, a smaller uh, in, um, investor inside sure. of our partnership, which invests into the project. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Cool. I, and, and what was the minimum there? Just uh, you said twenty five. Yeah, it's between twenty five to fifty thousand dollars on investment. I'll give you an example. If we're raising three uh, three million dollars for a specific project. We'll go out and raise 100 units of investment for $30,000 each. Mm-hmm. Uh, my partner, David, and I always invest on, uh, on each of our projects, whether he does it all or I do it with him. We do it together. But typically, we're, we're investing together and we're, all, we're both involved in the projects. And so, you know, he and I may take one or two or three units each, and then the rest would be uh, open to the, um, to the investors. And we do that because, again, we expect a developer to invest portion of the equity that they want us to bring in and we want to show the investors that we're bringing in our own money to it. Right. Yeah. 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 Which if, if anyone wants to, to hear more uh, about John's um, uh, origins uh, in the previous episode, I mean, it, it was pointed out that, you know, he didn't find an area of the market that needed to be fixed. He just was very successful in one thing and just started taking people along for the ride. So this is, yep. this is uh, you're, you're doing what John was doing and, and how John got to where he is now. Um, yeah. Now it, with with JID specifically, do you guys now have like a niche of like, hey, we focus on developments, but really only these types, right? We stay stay away from these types of uh, re- this type of real estate, and we're really just focused on this. Yeah, I mean, we we like development, we like new construction because there's not a lot of people doing it, and because our investors do like the high yield returns, given the level of risk and the level of investment at that twenty five to fifty thousand dollar range. So we tend to. We tend to like those development and new construction projects because they take a little longer, but those yields are a lot nicer, a lot higher. And, you know, it's definitely a lot riskier than, let's say, a cash flowing, stabilized assets that's paying out 60% a year. Um, Our projects tend to have more traction because of the fact that they got those higher yields. Um, And I would say, you know, if if it meets the criteria of the location, the experience of the developer, uh, our comfort with them, how well they've done, the worst deal to the best deal. Uh, and, you know, a lot of things like getting into the sauce, not too much, but like whether or not the land is entitled or not entitled, if it's zoned or not zoned. A lot of times the land is zoned, but it's not entitled. So it's going to take longer to get through the entitlement process to, to get approval to build that specific type of asset. That's a lot of risk. You may not get entitled. If you don't get entitled, you can't close and the deal doesn't happen. So you got to make sure you're working with the right people. But, um, but most of the time we're on entitled land that zone, we call it by right or subject to, to be able to build on that for the type of asset class that the developer is bringing in. But there's still risk there. And so the higher the risk, the higher the return. You're typically making as a business for that entity, I would say anywhere from you know 28% to 35% ROI, which is about, mid 20s to high 20s IRR compounded and uh, that's on any given development deal and uh, we typically then have a waterfall structure to get us that with the sponsor and then what we do is we set up a waterfall structure with our investors that pays them a percentage of that profit which still makes them that 15 to 20 percent yeah can you so just real quick to nerd out a little yeah. bit, can you explain a waterfall? Like, you know, kind of like you did. Yeah, I mean, a waterfall is just a, waterfalls. Yeah. It's just a tier level, kind of like, um, it's like a structured level or tier of how people are paid back their capital, um, their profits from distributions, how the management piece, and an example would be us as management gets paid. Um, sure. There's terms in there like preferred return um, that 
that you have to look at. So the way we set up our waterfall is um, first and foremost, we're always going to look to try to get back the investor's capital first, if that's right. the way it works. And then after they get back their investment capital, then we're going to pay a preferred return, which is usually about on our development deals, about 12% a year. Even right. if if it's a deferred uh, a deferred return or a crude return, which basically means that you know, in development, you're not going to have any distributions because you're building it getting right. ready. So it's not going to be done in for a couple of years, but that 12% adds up each year. So that preferred return gets paid back. And then after the preferred return gets paid back, usually management then gets their piece of the pie based on the waterfall. And then the remaining profits, if are any, would get split. We usually do a 60-40 split in favor of the investors. Okay. So in a perfect world, on our deals, the investors are going to make about a 12% preferred return. And then with the profit split, we're going to try to get them to around 15 to 20% a year with the remaining profits. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Very cool. So that 12% is pretty healthy. You know, I mean, you know, usually on a cash flow deal, you'll see a six or 7% pref. Uh, and again, it's because it's less risk. You got tenants in there, you're getting cash flow. It's a stabilized asset. With us, you know, you could have a piece of dirt, but we want to make sure the investors realize hey, before JID takes anything, our company, you're going to get your money back. And you're going to get 12% a year. Can't guarantee it because we know it's risk, sure. but that's your kind of make me sleep well at night mm-hmm. yeah. for, you know, so you can feel good about the deal. And we, we have other caveats, like we don't participate in capital calls. So you guys know what a capital call is, but for your listeners, you know, a developer could always come back and say, Hey, I need more money. And it says in my operating agreement, you can bring in up to 20% more of what you invested in. But we don't participate in that. We always make sure that the sponsor is the one that's going to bring in any additional capital or is responsible for that. So that means that we don't bring in any other money. If there's an opportunity to, we may have the option to, but we don't participate. The other is we don't participate in um, the debt piece, the financing on the debt, meaning we don't personally guarantee anything. So God forbid, and this has never happened, and I'm knocking on wood, uh, we've never lost any money uh, on any of our deals. The worst deal we had is we had to return investment capital because the deal didn't close. And that was the worst that happened. And those happen sometimes. So, yeah. but um, we don't guarantee any debt, which is also a big thing. Big thing. Yeah. Which, well, I yeah, mean, just, go ahead, sorry. Uh, I, I mean, I was just going to say something real quick on like, uh, it's a good point of why it's really uh, important to get good counsel and do your research. Cause you know, a lot of people, you know, the whole capital call thing, right? I mean, that's one of those situations where, you know, an investor might find themselves like, wait a minute, what? Like, yeah. but I don't have another check to write. Right. So I mean, it's right. just a, a good example of like, Hey, uh, real estate's awesome. Do a lot of research and education and partner with the right people. These are the, then these are some of the things that could happen. You always want to be transparent and let folks know. And as an investor, the folks that invest with us, we, we like those questions when they ask us things like, you know, okay, what's the exit strategies? Which, what's the, uh, what's the stress test break even, you know, what happens if this happens? How much of my profit am I going to make? You know, these are the things. And so now we're, we always do that, but now we have a consultant that comes on and does that purely for, that purpose. And we actually have that stuff available on all of our deals so that people can go in and see how we did some of that sausage making. We're very transparent, nothing to hide. We always want to share that information with folks. You know, we feel it's really important. And also, you know, we want to make sure the sponsors know that, you know, if we need to ask you these questions, and that's why we do a lot of upfront stuff with them, we want to make sure they know, hey, we may want some of those answers. So that's why we build that relation with them upfront. And they understand all that going in because we don't necessarily may have not have all the detailed information. So we may have to go back to the spot. We may have to pull that in. And we sure. do that with them. So, yeah. And, and so we've had a lot of success with this model and it, and it works very well. Um, and we, uh, we're, we're, we are a unique business because um, the, the institutional equity that's out there, like pension funds and insurance funds and all of these big REITs, they're not writing checks for anything below 15, $20 million, right? Um, and then you got these high net worth individuals and accredited investors that may write a check for a million or half a million, but they're not going to write a check for 3 million or 4 million unless they're a family office, maybe. So that's where we have a nice niche that 500,000 to let's say five, $6 million uh, in that sandbox is where we play really well. And believe it or not, you, you probably laugh at this. That's probably the hardest money to raise because it's not easy to get that little three to 4% of the capital stack remaining in a deal. It's, it's tough to get over that hump and that's where we can help. Yeah. 
So I, just to accurate, why is that? Why, do, why is that that toughest part to raise that smaller amount? Well, typically the the, uh, the sponsor is going to be bringing in that money, right? So the sponsor would be the one to say, okay, I need another $5 million and I'm going to go to my my uh, my executives or I'm going to go into my pocket or I'm going to go raise this money myself through my friends and family. Whereas they can come to a business like us, get the money they need. They don't have to deal with the investors. Sure. They don't have to put the private placement memorandum together, which we'll talk about. They don't have to do all the SEC filings. We do all that. So right. it's like, you know, why would I want to go out and deal with all that when I go to John? Yeah, I got to pay a premium for it. But look at all the stuff John does. He brings me a, 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 a uh, an entity with a PPM. They're all been vetted for credit investor status or sophisticated. They meet the criteria. They have all the money I need. And I don't have to worry about it knowing that John's there as long as the deal gets pushed through. It looks good. I get all his questions answered. He's giving me the time. He's on the phone with me telling me how the raise is going. And they don't have to deal with these twenty five dollars to $50,000 level investors. That's my job. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so kind of going back to what we talked about in the first episode is doing what you do well, right? Sticking in your sticking with your niche. Yeah. Let the developer be the developer. You know, let you be the capital raiser and let the bank loan the money. And everybody, everybody gets paid what they want to get paid. Exactly. And yeah. when I work with the sponsor that I've partnered with or I've done a deal or two or three before with or I've just met and I'm really feeling good about – when they send me a deal, 50% of that headache of, oh man, I've never worked with this guy before, blah, 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 blah. All that is like, you don't take it for granted, but you feel good about the fact that now I can go and I can focus on the deal. I don't have to focus on the sponsor. I've done my homework. I know who they are. Some of them are very close friends. I've known them for 20 years plus. These are good people uh, yeah. that I can trust and I know work well. Now let's focus on the deals. Let's help yeah. them to make sure they see that we see some things they may not see from this or from that. Well, why are you saying this? The market's saying that. Can we tweak that? Oh, yeah. Okay. So that's when you get that constructive um, discussions going on. Deals. Yeah. And, and let's, you know, because you brought up like, hey, it's, it's hard for the developer to get over this hurdle of getting these, you know, small, small portions of money. Uh, and that's where you come in. So from the, from the investor side or from the, you know, the other side of the fence, what specifically are they getting from you where it's like, hey, this is what you have to have to play in this arena? And, Mm -hmm. and why, you know, and basically you've streamlined it for them. So what are they specifically getting? Yeah. So, you know, we talked a little bit about this one in the last episode when Robert Mm -hmm. Kiyosaki, um, you know, was going to invest with rich dad, poor dad, he didn't meet the criteria, right? So they gave him all this cool stuff. He was so excited. And they said, sorry, Robert, you can't play because you're not accredited. Right. Right. So if I get somebody that calls me from California and says, Hey, John, I want to invest with you. My first question is, are you an accredited investor? And if they say no, then they can't because I don't know them. I haven't built a relationship with them. Uh, the SEC is very, very, very stringent on this. So an accredited investor is an individual that earns $200,000 of adjusted gross income over the last two years. That number at the top of the tax return, if they're single, if they're joint, it's 300000 of adjusted gross income over the last two years. If uh, they don't meet the adjusted gross income or the, the, uh, the gross income uh, criteria, they have to have a million dollars or more of net worth, not including their primary residence. That one of those has to be checked. If they can't check one of those, then they are not accredited, okay? They could come in with an LLC or a trust as an entity, and there's other criteria for that. And all this is open source information on the SEC website. They can go and look at that. But if that individual or that group doesn't meet the accredited investor criteria, they can't invest with us, okay? We do have some very close friends and family that we know, we've gone through, we set the parameters, not as stringent as the SEC, but still very stringent, but again, we, we are comfortable with them. They are comfortable with us. They live local. They're family. We have a relationship. The uh, SEC is a little bit gray area there. So we go overboard and be conservative on that to make sure we don't, you know, run into any issues. Very cool. <laughs> so that, that's the individual. One credit that, card. Yeah, that's right. So those are the, gr- those are the folks that are going to invest with us, you know, 90% of the time. Um, most of our deals are um, set up through our attorney. When you file with the SEC, there's two types of unregistered filings. There's the you guys probably know the form the 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 B five oh the form B five oh six B or the five oh six C. Five oh six C is typically the is is the accredited investor, meaning that only people that can invest in that as accredited investors. The five hundred six B allows you up to thirty five non non accredited investors and an unlimited amount of accredited investors. So most of the time we'll do a B because we don't even have thirty five non accredited investors, and it allows us to raise unlimited amount. Yeah. 
So and, and so let's say you know someone calls you and you know they are the the accredited investor. Uh, what what's next? Right. I mean, do you yeah. have a bevy of you know like a whole menu item, or it's like, hey, we only got these three projects. What are you looking for? No, no, it's a good question. So if somebody calls me and says they're an accredited investor, uh, they fill out our accredited investor questionnaire. Uh, we do allow them to self-accreditate, but when they do their first deal with us, they have to provide us either a third-party letter saying they're accredited, or we have a letter that they can provide to their attorney, their broker, their financial advisor, or stock broker who has to sign that with their license information and everything, and they send that to us. So um, when they come on board as an accredited investor, they can then see our deals that we've already done, right? Because that's what I'd like to do. Yeah. What I like to do, and I said this in your last, uh, your last, uh, our last episode, is that we want to bring folks on before they see their first light. We want them to feel comfortable. We want sure. them to, you know, like us, like what they see, ask us their questions, and then they have the opportunity to see their first deal. So that would be the next thing: fill out the accredited investor questionnaire, you fill that out, you're on our list, and now you can see past, current, and future deals. Gotcha. Very cool. Okay. Yeah. yeah so kind of, you know, switching back. So how did you find, how did you figure out this was your niche, right? Like in the, in the whole real estate game, right? Cause there's, you know, there's literally hundreds of different niches that you can be in, in the real estate game. And how are you like, Hey, we do these kind of deals and I'm the finance guy, mm -hmm. you know, how did that kind of come about? Was it kind of developing that or you're just like, Hey, I have a Nick, a knack, uh, you know, a knack for this part or it just, this is what I learned. And yeah, that's a good question, Josh. I mean, for me personally, it was just the fact that I had invested passively for, yeah. for those numbers of years. And I, and I grew the skill set of being able to look through these things. And um, I was able to really, you know, understand it, like it, feel comfortable with it, a lot, very, you know, um, a limited amount of risk. So like, you know, if I'm somebody new starting out, I would take a piece of paper and I'd have two columns, you know, risk, non-risk, you know, what, what is it that I want to do passively or actively that could hurt me and not hurt me. And um, when you look at a passive investor, um, you know, 90, 99% of the time, you know, the worst that's going to happen to you is you lose your money, right? Yeah. Well, I can lose my money right now investing in Bitcoin, right? Or right. I can lose money investing in something else. So if I could get involved in real estate, have these really cool projects, be an owner, be protected under the, um, the, the securities guidelines and, and be able to participate and make these types of returns and I qualify then you know, it's just a nice way to diversify your portfolio. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, anyways, again, we're kind of going down some investment advice. Mark and I, you know, we always try and get our clients to at least have at least have the conversation about adding real estate to their portfolio. I mean, it's yeah, it has lots well, of I, options. We, Mark and I can't go into all of them right now, but yeah, you know, yeah. It's, it's a it's a great another asset class to have in your portfolio. And we highly recommend it. So and, 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 and also and, getting getting yeah. them to realize that it's it's not like, hey, uh, go buy a house and just rent it. Right. I mean, there's very right. many, you know, when you say real estate, some people just be like, nah, I don't want to deal with tenants and landlords. It's like, that's like one subsection of subsection of real estate. So, well, and the nice part too is my, my partner in the business, the co-managing partner is an enrolled agent, a federally licensed certified public accountant. So David does all the tax returns for every sure. investors on all their deals. So, you know, and the fact that we set these up as single owner entities, you know, single partnership entities is just one K1. So, you know, he's sending them their K1s on our Juniper Square portal. They can go through those with David. You know, they get David's services to help as far as answering questions. And then they get to file it as one of their, uh, uh, you know, investments with their CPA. Whereas yeah. with a sponsor, a sponsor is going to throw the K1 at you and say, okay, you know, that's you get from me and good luck. We we walk through that process. We provide investor statements. We so we help both on the investment side and on the finance side as far as sure. making sure that our investors have the subject matter expertise in those areas to help them, especially with taxes, because there's a lot of there's a lot of headache with these things mm -hmm. when it comes yeah. to taxes. And David's just amazing when it comes to that stuff. Well, you have the IRS involved, so it's always a nightmare. Exactly. <laughs> hey, I didn't say it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I said it. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Josh, uh, so, you're going to get audited now. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Already. Tell my CPA the audit it on its way. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when you're kind of going down that niche, like what was that like doing your first, you know, because have you had other entrepreneurs on and a couple of guys that have been kind of serial entrepreneurs and have done, had exits, you know, they're like, you know, it's at first it's almost impossible to raise money because you don't have a track record. And then once you have a track record and you don't need money, everybody wants to invest. 
almost. So how, you know, have you kind of worked through that initial getting raising those first rounds of capital and getting people to kind of I'll, I'll use the word trust you really for lack yeah. of that, you know to to prove that your model worked. Well, first and foremost, I always tell them why money's coming in the deal. Uh, yeah. And second is you start small. We started on residential renovation properties back in 2013. We were raising $200,000 with four guys, you know, 50000 in each. We'd all, you know, we'd be bringing in the money and then we'd get to take the profits. And, and you know, we started small. We, we, we built that track record. We started building presentations. I mentioned in the last episode being in the military, you know, we're PowerPoint Rangers, Josh. I was able to build these yeah. slide decks and show new investors who want to come on. Hey, here's what we've done. Here's our profits. Wow, you made 30% a year, 40% a year. No way. All right, well, here's the breakdown, whatever. That's how you start building your born of investors, your stable investors. And then, you know, you start growing from there. You, you say, okay, well, what is my goal? Do I want to just be a lender, a private money lender, or a hard money lender, and invest with you know two, two and twelve, you know twelve percent interest, two point two points, or, sure. or do I want to you know be a, an equity firm? Do I want to raise equity for larger projects and, and have more returns but bigger, bigger risk? You know these are the questions you have to ask. We always knew we wanted to be in the equity world. We knew we wanted to invest on the bigger projects, but we wanted to yeah. start small to show folks, hey, here's our track record, here's what we're doing, and then we would start you know at the five hundred thousand dollar level, the seven hundred fifty thousand dollar. One million dollar level, smaller, bigger, bigger, bigger crawl walk run. To then we then had that track record to show folks. Here's where we started. Here's where we're going, and now here's where we're kind of hanging out. And that yeah. and that worked out great. And um, yeah, just continually putting the right people in place, having the right uh, skill set for the business, growing and scaling at a very balanced and comfortable pace. Growing, you know, so. Our investors are, I would say about 80% of the investors we have have all come on board as original folks that then have gone out and helped us bring on new investors or we've organically brought on. Or I went out to a, a networking group and I got to meet this person who introduced me to that person and we got to grow a relationship and they became an investor. And then I have a friend who's a doctor who introduced me to eight more doctors and I got to meet them and I had a dinner with them and I'm showing them renderings and they're like, holy crap, this is great. So, I mean, that's your strategy, you know, that's how you do it. And it's yeah. always nice doing it, you know, face to face or now screen to screen. Um, and it, yeah. it's nice to be able to do that because people get to see you and, and some people don't care. Like I read your stuff, uh, I'll fill out your form and I want to start investing. Okay. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and uh, you know, kind of in that same vein of, uh, you know, starting in one area and knowing where you wanted to head, you know, in our first episode, we talked about you having a vision for like, Hey, it's really cool taking an investor from this was a rundown area. They're an investor. Now I'm getting to walk them through this awesome area. What's your guys' process for finding those opportunities? It's really the sponsors. It's not finding the deal. It's finding the sponsor. Uh -huh. Cause if you find the right sponsor, you're going to find the right deals. And that's kind of how I feel is like, I, I don't want to waste time looking at deals. I want to, I want to spend time and invest time in learning and being with good sponsors. And so if I find a good sponsor and now it's really, I, like I tell you, it's, they're coming to us. I don't even have to go out anymore. I mean, we're getting so many coming to us. We've got so many deals and it's like, it's great. I'm happy. I'm happy. But it's like, I know that those three horses have won the race for me every time. And those are the ones that I'm going to go to first. And so that's what's happening right now. So I have more deals than I have money for which is fine. I'm happy with that. But if I find a good sponsor that I want to meet and I go there and I talk to them and I meet their team and they see what we do and they know about us because they were talked to by Jim who they trust. And I was talked to by Jim who I trust and we get together and we have a great relationship and I start looking at them and I see they're good and I do my checklist and meet the criteria. And then I start looking at their deals and I say, okay, you know, let's, let's start small. Let's do a, a million and a half dollar raise for a 20 unit, in uh, in DC, you know, and let's just start. Let's start on a small end of the spectrum to get some street credit and some proof of concept with our team, and then we can go after some of the bigger ones. So, just to define terms, like uh, define what a sponsor is, just so kind of people yeah. understand. So, like in the military or in a program, a sponsor is someone that kind of takes the deal from cradle to grave. They are solely responsible. They're going to be responsible for the, uh, the purchase of the property, going out and getting the bank uh, money for it. They're going to basically bring everything together and, um, and they're going to be the, the company or the individual that is the go-to person for the project. They're the active investor. 
they're the active piece. They may also be a developer. So they may be a sponsored developer. So they're going to be the group that's controlling the project and developing it to be ready to build on it or sell it once it's finished being built. Okay. So um, you have a apartment group like uh, uh, Joe Fairless or Greg Cardone and, and they have a, um, a, an apartment building and they're the sponsor. They're the investor active piece that runs the property. They're going to be in charge of everything. Operations of the building, management, handling the property manager's deal, and they're going to be paying the investors their returns. They're going to be dealing with everything. That's what the sponsor does. Gotcha. So I just had a curiosity. So when you guys are putting these deals together, I, let's just say you know, you're putting together a small apartment complex. Are you buying those to sell to an institution usually or whoever is buying that like into some sort of REIT? Or yeah, it's work? neat. So let me, let me walk you through three, two quick examples. Um, again, we don't actually buy it. The sponsor is going to buy it. We're part of the partnership that buys the land and has title to it. Sure. So if the sponsor goes out, they got the property. Let's say they're building a 100-unit condominium project. We just finished a 110-unit on D.C. right on the water. We're looking at the Anacostia River. And so that project, they burnt the dirt. They got it developed. They built it. After they developed it, now they're selling condos. We got about 95 of the 110 condos sold. As they sell condos and pay the bank back, then they start paying us back as equity. And then, you know, basically that's how we exit is once that – Last unit is sold, we're done. We're out of that deal. Okay. Or it could be something which we're doing now, which is really exciting, is they're getting land, they're developing it, they're building an apartment complex. It's called 190 units of residential apartments, one, two, three bedroom and bath, with about 2,000 square feet of retail, seven story building in Richmond, which we have going right now. And so once that's done, our exit is going to be a refinance. When they refinance out the construction, uh, debt and the equity in the development through construction phase will be part of that takeout. And that's how we could come out of the deal with both our money and our profits. Now, they may turn around and say, how would you like to stay in the deal and get cash flow? Oh, that's very interesting. How does that work? Well, we'll give you back your equity. Okay, let's say it's $2 million. And let's say you made $2 million in profit, right? So you made 2x, 2x return. Let's say it's a four-year deal. So that's 25% a year. It's not bad. We take the $2 million and we give them back their, uh, their capital, their investment. We take the $2 million in profit and we put it into the stabilized piece. Guess what's getting cash flow now? That $2 million in profit. Well, what's my ROI or my IR on that? 100%. How could it be 100%? Because I gave you back your investment money. Now you're making money on your profit. That's like when you play blackjack, which I love, by the way. And I'm playing with the house money because now yeah. I'm making a 100% return. So the $2 million sits in the deal, right? It's making cash flow, right? You're getting depreciation loss, right? Yeah, I got to pay it rental income, which sucks because that's it's income, but who cares? You get the depreciation loss. 10 years down the line, property finishes. Guess what? It appreciated at 40%, right? And I'm now getting all the cash flow for the 10 years on my capital gains profit in the deal over the four years that was never liquidated. Guess what? I don't have to pay taxes on that. It's earning me cash flow. And then at the end of the deal, I'm, I'm getting the $2 million I made on the development and I'm getting appreciation on the back end at 30%. That's another $600,000. Now I'm paying $2.6 million on capital gains at the 10th year of an ownership on an apartment complex. Yep. How does that blow your mind? Yeah. How say- awesome is that? And that's what we're doing right now. That, and that's yeah. why it's really exciting because you're really letting that fruit ripen on the tree before you pull it off. It's, sure. it's amazing. It's an amazing concept. And that's why we're really excited about it. Yeah. Love it. Absolutely. And, and, and if anyone's feeling like that uh, Zach Galifianakis picture where there's just all the math equations <laughs> around his head. Happy to walk through right, it. Right. Don't even use pictures. I mean, trust me, if you want to get in touch with uh, JD Investments, uh, you know, they, yeah. they can walk you through that and exactly yeah, how all that works. Because, yes, you're right. When you get your money back and then you still just end up making money, it's like, how do you not, how do you not at least want to read more about it? Right. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to do it, but that should at least get people excited. No, it is. It's amazing. Yeah, it, uh, it's, it's really cool. It's yeah, awesome. I, I, I think. How, how do I how do I say this? So in general investing. I think Wall Street's done a really good job of showing people the shiny object over here and, you know, hiding the ugly part over here. And, you know, when, when you go into some of these, like, again, you're taking out lots of layers of, of fees, right? Just in general, right? So you're, that's not running through the Wall Street mechanism. But two, when you start, you have to start having those conversations about taxes and when you're paying them and how you're laying that out and all that kind of stuff. And, that, you know, that makes 
that makes an investment go from a good investment to a great investment. You know, and you, again, you need to run that through your CPA. You need to do all your due diligence. Yeah. But you can't just look at baseline returns and be like, oh, that's only a 5% baseline return. You're like, no, you're, you're missing all the other pieces that count mm-hmm. that just don't get counted on that one return, right? Like, yeah, you might only be getting a 5% preferred note on the back end, but you already got all your money back. Right. You know, that's make it a hundred percent. It's making a hundred percent. Right. And yeah. And it's so hard to explain that to people. Sometimes they're like, yeah, but I'm only making 5%. You're like, no, you made a hundred percent already. Right. No, but you gave my money back. You're like, no, you get to go and reinvest that money and you get to keep making the anyways. It's just, and and then to throw what our listeners have heard Josh and I say numerous, 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 numerous times is, uh, uh, taxes is a winning strategy. Knowing, knowing how to play the tax game. Um, you know, uh, I think it was Ed Cotney, you know, he was like, protect what you have, don't pay too much to the IRS, and then I don't care what you do on the investment side. <laughs> right? Like yeah. if you can yeah. if you're if you're if you're protecting what you have and you're not paying no, too much to the true. IRS, I mean trust me, you're gonna you're gonna do fine. If you could take post tax dollars and and use that as your way of making money and the money you're making is staying in deals or in are in R or are in um, uh, non-liquidated assets, like hard assets, and they're just appreciating and appreciating and appreciating. Yeah, you have to pay some taxes potentially if you're making income or distributions, but you're taking the money out, the equity, which has already been taxed, and you're putting it in. And every time you're making profits, you're able to pull it out and put it somewhere else. That's wealth. I mean, that's growing yep. your wealth. And, you know, if if we could do something where I use an example, take $2 million that you already pay taxes on, make you another two, keep it in a deal. And get it appreciated, never liquidating it to pay your capital gains and just keep paying, you know, just keep going. You know, that's, that's great. I mean, I'd love to spend another minute at some point talking to you guys about the opportunity zone, because that, that too is amazing. So, you know, definitely want to spend a minute on that when we have time, because that's a great, great strategy. Well, well, perfect segue. You know, we should talk about right now. That's what I all of a sudden wanted to talk about. Opportunity zones. I saw that. Light went off. John, John, how about how about we'll run the podcast here? Huh? We'll we'll, we'll (laughs) give you directions here where things are going. Jeez, the wings. You got it. Start your own podcast. Yeah, that's your job. I'm having too much fun. (laughs) No, yeah. Let's dive into the opportunity zone parts and and kind of you know yeah talk about that. You know, explain what it is, how it works, and then you know kind of how you use it in your business. Yeah, so Donald Trump and and uh, Senator Rick Scott and Senator Cory Booker kind of all came together. Governor McMaster's out of South Carolina. All these smart people came together and they thought of this well, brainchild. Wait, wait, did you just say Cory Booker was smart? I, I, yeah, sorry. I know. I'll give him credit. He was bipartisan. He, he, had, he had to sign the box. I don't know. How, yeah, we'll leave it at that. But um, they came together and they put together this Opportunity Zone program. And basically the way it works is that the federal government went out to, to the governors of the 49 states and, and D.C., the mayor, and say, hey, you're going to your jurisdictions. We want you to look for land that's, you know, property that's, you know, very uh, needs to be regentrified in lower income areas. We want to help the communities, you know, all, all this great stuff. And so each of the governors were able to, you know, map out where they wanted their opportunity zones. And there's a map online. You can pull it up and you can see where they're all at. And, um, and so the, these commercial developers said, okay, you know, we're going to partner with the government. We're going to go out and get this land and we're going to buy it just like we would. And we're going to, utilize it for uh, for this program. And so as a developer, there's certain criteria you have to meet in order to not only get the land as it is as an opportunity zone piece of land, but you also have to meet criteria in order for it to be treated as an opportunity zone investment or what we call a qualified opportunity zone business, a QASB. And so the QASB is the not only the property and the land, but also the um, what's going to be utilized there, whether it's a business or residential, whatever it is has to meet certain criteria, and that's available online. Well, when you get the land and you put on there the QASB, now you can get investors to come in to invest through what's called a QAF, or Qualified Opportunity Zone Fund, and the funds can invest into these QASBs, okay? So the QASB is the investment. The QAF is the mechanism or fund that invests into the, into the property or the investment or the mechanism, okay? Um, and then what ends up happening is you can only invest a certain type of money in this and it's deferred capital gains, short or long-term capital gains that can be invested. So if you go out and you have a hundred shares of Apple and you made, you know, you invested a hundred thousand and you made another hundred in profit, 
you know, it's not like a 1031 where you take the 100 you made, 100 you earn and 100 you made and put it into this as a 1031. You take either or all of it or a portion of your $100,000 in profit and you can bring it into the QAF, Qualified Opportunity Zone Fund of a company that offers this, that is allowed to invest in that. They have to meet certain criteria and they're investing into QASBs, into these businesses. So again, I'm not an expert. I know a lot about it, but make sure you talk to your accountant and talk to your brokers about it because it's a great program. But the premise is you're taking deferred capital gains. You're investing them into a qualified opportunity zone fund and business. You're getting to defer the capital gain on that investment for five years. Okay. Unfortunately, you can't take advantage of the uh, reduction in basis anymore. That ended in 2000 and 2021, where you're able to take off a percentage of that deferred gain in the fifth year when you file your taxes. So if you had the hundred thousand and you did it in 21 and year five, instead of paying taxes on a hundred thousand, you'd pay taxes on 90,000. Now that went away. So you do have to pay taxes on the full 100, but you get the full power of the investment for the first five years, right? Yeah. Then you're paying your taxes on that in year five, at capital gains rates, state and federal, and then um, if you start getting tenants or you're investing in a stabilized asset, you know, that starts bringing in tenants and you're making rental income, you're going to get the rental income. You're going to get the depreciation loss, right? But once the property finishes, which I'll get to in a second, whenever you have a regular property, what ends up happening with depreciation? Well, you have to pay recapture, recapture gain, 1250 gain on your K-1. Well, guess what? Opportunity zone, you have bonus depreciation. You don't have to pay the depreciation back. So you get the depreciation loss and you get the rental income. So that's number two, the deferred gain for five years. And then you get bonus depreciation, which basically washes out your rental income or it helps you on your tax return. Right? The third benefit is 10 years or more when you liquidate and you have a gain, right? The gain that you earn is tax-free federally. And depending what state you're from is also tax-free for the state you reside in. If you're in New York, North Carolina, Arizona, don't hold me to that, Massachusetts, uh, and California, you have to pay state income, a state capital gains on that. There are non-conforming states. I believe those are the ones, but do your own research. But at the end of the day, you're not paying any capital gains federally and you know, 90% of the time state. So like, okay, so you put in a million dollars, let's say you made a 9% return on paper, which actually is about 15% when you look at all these tax benefits yep. and you're making, let's say 10% of that or 8% of that, or, or uh, as a return, let's say 800,000 of that is going to be capital gains. You're not paying any taxes on the capital gains. Your depreciation is offsetting your rental income. Yep. Holy crap. The only tax I'm paying on is the 100,000 or the million I brought in and I'm walking away with 1.9 million, let's say. Uh, okay. That's awesome. Well, I mean, it should know. be the, the I, I'm going to guess that people are going to rewind and replay that four minutes. Yeah. That's and we have this on, on our website. Yeah. I have this on my website. I got the HUD website on there. We have a lot of the information that we've collected, but yeah, I mean, you know, look, you can go, you should go online. You should research this on your own. Talk to your accountant. Uh, and, if, your accountant if your accountant doesn't know about it, find an account that's good and opportunities. Fire because, immediately. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, fine, no, I mean, yeah. you know, and, you know, I don't want to get into politics too much, but, you know, this is this is a use of government policy trying to get money invested back into underserved, underutilized areas. And it's, you know, there's, you know, it's it was a really good use. They're incentivizing people to go invest in low income areas. Yep. It, but using again, using not the government to solve the problem, but using private industry to go solve the problem and just giving you a tax break for it, which I, you know, which I think was just awesome. And I think it's actually it's shown to have worked out very, very well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, places I mean, have, it's, there's some places have gotten investment that would have got would have never have gotten investments at this yeah. level. Yeah, right. I mean, it's just yeah. a way for you again to to kind of protect your wealth, like you said, and also help the communities, help these communities that, that can utilize. Yeah, regentrification. Yeah. Absolutely. And and, and yeah. when do when, when do opportunity zones phase out? Because I know they're not a forever thing. Yeah, I, I believe 2026 is uh, the date. Don't hold me to that, but I know 2026 is like when it's supposed to phase out where we can't, you're not going to be able to invest in them anymore. There was talk that this administration was going to get rid of them, but 
They think they're more targeting uh, 1031s and uh, DSTs, I believe. But I don't think opportunity zones are going to are going to get taken away. Now, one of the things I will give this administration credit for is that uh, the accounting and the um, kind of better rec- recording of the stuff is is much better as far as accounting the details of the of the amounts of money is brought in and just you know doing a better um, job of of just accounting for everything making sure that everything's teed up better. And, and, and that, that happens. I mean, you're going to refine the process, but yeah, that, that was one big problem. I know that there wasn't a lot of that going on initially and now they're doing a much better job. Yeah. I, you know, personal, you know, reading it, you know, again, very debatable, but you know, the 1031, I don't think is ever going to go away, at least in this current form, that would, that would crush the economy on lots of levels. Um, you know, they'll, they'll find their money in other ways. They'll keep stealing it from the middle class, but anyways, um, you know, and I, I, I think you'll see this another iteration of this happen at some point, just because it has been so successful. Um, you know, it's a, it's kind of a win for both parties, right? Because you know yeah. you have the Democrats saying like, look, you know, hey, basically I'm bringing money into your into your districts, right? That usually get wouldn't get invested in, right? Because of of lots of reasons. And Republicans are like, hey, look, we got a tax break, so everybody everybody's happy. Yeah, it's interesting. Like you know, you guys, we mentioned this in the last episode. Like they wanted to get rid of the self-directed IRAs and that Bill Better back, whatever it is. And um, you know, I, I was listening to um, a, a webcast on it, and the guys who were talking about it were self-directed IRA businesses, and they were in Arizona, and they were talking about how they went to Cinema, and they were talking to um, the senators there, and they were just talking to them about this, and they're saying, "Look, this isn't just for the rich. Like a lot of Americans use their self-directed IRAs to invest." Yeah. And I think it was really just more of an educating thing for the senators. And when they found out, they're like, oh, crap, we can't get rid of that. You know, like because right. they realize that, you know, so a lot of times everybody's like tax the rich. Tax. Yeah. But, you know, eventually if you're doing the right thing and you're investing in whatever, you, one day you're going to be rich. So right. If you keep saying that, you're going to end up saying that for yourself. So, <laughs> you know, it's just it is what it is. Uh, well, I was going to say on the self regulated driver front, too, it's kind of silly because it's like the, the rich are still going to, you know, invest in the same things but that you know guy with the fifty thousand dollar i right he's probably not yeah he's gonna be stuck right. with his uh s&p 500 etf uh, etf right yeah exactly you no know, i i just think you've really seen a lot of investments in places that probably would have not been on people's radar to invest mm-hmm. but there's lots of deals that made sense now and you're like oh sweet i'll go make this area nice again because we get a huge tax break for it and you know you know, I can buy my land and property cheaper because, you know, but we make it really nice. And you're, now mm-hmm. you're bringing a whole new tax basis into an area and all kinds of stuff. So I, I was, it's been mm-hmm. a very cool thing. I, I hope they, anyways, Washington, if you're listening, you're probably not, but bring up, <laughs> uh, continue the, uh, the opportunity zones. It's a good yeah, thing. For you better hope Cory Booker's not listening. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. <laughs> yeah, we'll give him credit. Yeah, he gets credit for that one. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, sweet. So, you know, you know, as you're, so you, got GID up and running and you're looking for these deals and you know is GID going to continue to grow and are you going to start to you know you usually it's easier to raise chunks of money than it is lots of small monies right so how are you how are you going to manage that are you going to start to to kick out the little guys and and, and get bigger or are you going to kind of try to keep battling for the little guys no I mean I'd, I'd still love to continue to invest in residential renovation I mean if we could find a groups that that continually need that money, I would even look at standing up a fund just for one business and, and all the money that sure. would go into that fund would be for that one business. And I like the residential renovations because you're, you know, you're flipping home six to 12 months, you know, you could recycle that capital pretty well. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, you know, we talked about this a little bit in the last episode. I'm not a goal oriented person. I'm more, again, building good habits, good systems and good processes that, you know, goals will point me in the right direction to steal a quote from James Clear, but you know, atomic habits, but, I mean, you know, I think that's the way to go is if you build good processes and good habits, you know, you're going to, you're going to attain things that would be considered goals, but right. they're more than just goals. They're, you know, mm-hmm. bigger than goals or they're more encompassing of just goals. So I, I like to just have balance. I mean, you know, we got, we got a significant amount of capital out on the street, about 16, 17, 18 million dollars, but we're starting to bring in, uh, we're starting to go full cycle on some of our bigger deals. So that'll be great. They've been postponed because of COVID but they're all still hitting, you know, 80 to 90% of what we projected on our initial returns, which is great. You know, instead of making 18% investors are making, you know, it's 13, 14, 15% a year, which is, which is awesome. And it's actually for a longer period of time. So when you look at the dollars and the equity multiples, it's actually more than what they would make if they came out 
earlier. So we're, we're still doing very well, but I, I want balance. I don't, I don't, you know, I think we mentioned too, you know, crawl, walk, run is, is cool. I don't want to bite too much more than I can chew. There's word about rates going up and inflation still being around and costs are still going up and supply chain and all that, you know, so I want to make sure we're giving people money in this hand and giving them an opportunity if they want to come in with money, if they want in the other hand, it's up to them. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, we had this question on there, you know, where do you see, do you see inflation starting to creep in anywhere, anywhere? And, you know, kind of how's that affected and, you know, what are you guys planning for it? Yeah. I mean, I think the big challenge with inflation is really just the cost of material and construction for our, our um, sponsors, you know, and to pair that up with supply chain issues, it's good. It's a bit of a headache. So yeah, I mean, you know, sponsors, the sponsors we work with are willing to, you know, take a little bit out of their pocket to make sure returns are still very healthy for their investors, which is very much the reason why I work with these folks. They know that, uh, you know, when we're the same way. I mean, I'm paying my investors back first and I'm, and I'm totally like saying, yeah, I know my waterfall says I give you your prep and then I get a catch up, but I want you to get your full return before. And that's just how we're doing business. And, and I mean, look, it, that's, that's why I feel that people like to work with us and like to work with people like us, because sure. when you, you see the true colors of people, when the bad times come and not the good times. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, kind of, are, how are you seeing deal flow? You know, again, we're time stamping a little bit, but you're yeah. early 22. Oh, how, how are you seeing deal flow? Is it still strong or is there some changes happening or, you know, I was reading an article today. I think the, the hottest the hottest segments right now still are multifamily residential because occupancies are still at a record high and yeah. there's not enough house there's not enough housing and there's yep. not enough housing in the pipelines right now for a couple of years. So you're seeing occupancies in the ninety six and ninety seven percent, but you'd be like, Holy crap, like that's impossible. You're always building in a five to seven percent vacancy rate. Yeah. You know? But you know, you have to get concessions going and get those numbers. <clears throat> but right now it's just ridiculous because you can't go buy a house because they're too expensive. First time home buyers can't afford it. They can't bring in money to put down. So they're renting, but now you can't get into the rental market. So there's not a lot of housing, which kind of sucks for them. And it's hard, but as, a, yeah. as an investor, we're like, we find land, we get in at the right numbers on the front end, which is where you make your money. We're going to do great. And, um, and again, yeah. not take advantage of people, but when you look at what the developers are having to deal with on inflation and cost, it, it works its way out anyway. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, prices, inflation is the silent killer when it yeah. comes to profits, you know, and income. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, where, where can people find uh, you guys uh, on, on the internet, social media, you know, get in contact with you? I yeah. Mean, how are people going to get in touch? We have a, a website, so just www.jidinvestments.com. If you put those in your show notes, people can go to the website and really see what we're doing and take a look at some of the websites for our projects uh, and look at our investment services, uh, our funding services. We have a page on opportunity zones. So all of that information is on there. We also have, uh, we can give you a demo of our portal on Juniper Square if you want to check that out. Uh, we have a LinkedIn page. Uh, we have a Facebook page. I'm on LinkedIn. We have a YouTube channel. So all this stuff's available for your listeners. And, um, you know, my email, feel free to share it. It's just my first initial, jrabino at jidinvestments.com. If anybody's got questions or, you know, just wants to learn more about real estate investing, they can reach out anytime. I love talking to folks about that stuff because I am still there. I was there before and I love learning more about it. So, yeah. And for any of our listeners, we will have those in the show notes. Uh, And if you're watching on YouTube, they're going to be there as well. Uh, I mean, we've had we've had guests in the past who have said like, "Yep, uh, had some people reach out to me or or whatnot." So um, awesome. definitely, if you you want to call John, call John, or, you know, email John. Yeah, you know, I'm sure yeah, he'll email uh, me. Call me. Yeah, be great. I uh, love it. Awesome. No, thank you. I, that was a really good, you know, real estate kind of one on one on the on the uh, finance and structure side. I mean, obviously there was a bunch of other topics we could have got into. Sure. And, uh, you know, yeah. Let's do another one. I'm happy to come back like anytime. Hour. Yeah, so, if you guys want me to come back and do something specific, we can. I'd love to. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. No, we, yeah, absolutely. we didn't talk about bank financing and leverage and all that, you know, finding land. We, there's lots of stuff we did get into. It was oh, all yeah. fun stuff. Well, absolutely. Mark, you want to kick off the uh, speed round? Yes, speed round. Uh, all right, so speed round question number one. Uh, if you could get a Shark Tank investor to uh, partner with you, uh, who, assuming you have offers from everyone, who are you going with? Yeah. Uh, 
probably Barbara, she's such a smart lady when it comes to real estate. She could probably yeah. teach me and, and help me and build me. And, you know, she's amazing. I like Robert. Robert's cool. Mark's smart. But I definitely would say Barbara would be my number one. Yeah, she's, a, she's the real estate shark for, for sure. She's Absolutely. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, so real estate in the next, uh, you know, a half decade to, you know, to decade, you know, where, where do you kind of see it going? You kind of talked about uh, on the residential side, but, um, you know, any areas, geographic areas? I mean, I still think the Southeast is the hottest subregion in, in the country. I mean, as long as people keep moving and leaving the Northeast and the West Coast and heading to Texas or heading to the Southeast, which is where we are, businesses are going there. You know, uh, Atlanta, which is a huge market we're in, is arguably larger now than Hollywood when it comes to film production and movies. I want to go where people are going. I want to go where the weather's good. I want to go where the taxes are low and the cost of living is low. And quality of life is high so that's kind yeah. of where i see us going and i you know in a decade from now our opportunity zone deals should be coming to a close so yeah excited about that too nice very cool awesome uh so if you got to build your absolute dream project you got to design it start to finish what what are you building i'm going to be modest and say what we're doing now is our dream project you know the fact that we're going into this new really neat asset class that i explained from apartments where we could stay in this and just you know keep the money in and just let it grow i mean like i said um if i love blackjack and the best part of blackjack is when my money is here and i'm playing with the bank's money or i'm paying with the house's money and i'm just growing it and growing it and growing it and pulling it in you know that's that's the way to go uh and if we could keep doing that you know and just if i can go to my mailbox every quarter and and pull out you know cash flow for six deals or ten deals (laughs) life is good yeah making money while you sleep that's when it's right absolutely um so if you could acquire one skill tomorrow what would it be and why one skill what could it be and why um that's a great question uh one skill just i i think you know i i I think I have it as far as what i love and it's just being able to talk to people in a way that i'm genuine and i'm not you know trying to sugarcoat anything. And I just, I'm just try to be an honest person and, and just tell them about what your passion is, because I think it's a compliment. I'm not trying to pat myself on the back or be prideful, but I love when they say, yeah, we could just feel your energy. Like, you know, we yeah. want that, you know, and mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, and I want to give it to you. Like here, take it, you know, enjoy yeah. it. Let's, let's do it together. Let's have fun. And, and then being modest to say, teach me what I don't know. If you got something yeah. you can share with me, I'm, I'm all ears. I'm all, I'm all yours. Listen, so not, that's it. I wish so it was not time, listener. not time travel or the ability to fly. No, 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 no. I was going to go with teleportation, but uh, yeah, no, 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 no. I want to be a better simple, listener. John. Yeah, I, I'd like to be that a better listener. Yeah. I always joke, God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. So listen, <laughs> listen. Huh. I'm not going to, I'm not going to teach my wife that thing. <laughs> uh, okay. Last one. If you got a round trip ticket anywhere, uh, where are you going and who are you taking? You know, we've been down to go to Punta Cana. I've never been there. And uh, my wife and I are big fans of just laying out on the beach and vegging and the kids, letting them run around. Um, so Punta Cana with my family would be awesome. Nice. All right. Yeah. Josh, he's not taking uh, the uh, podcast host. So, uh, yeah. Oh, Strag- man. Strag- Strag- Noted. And, uh, John. Noted. Uh, doesn't, want to te- doesn't want to do teleportation or take podcast hosts on vacation. No way. <laughs> Put me on oh. the beach with a Corona and a lime and I'll be happy. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, awesome well thank you so much for being on i, I mean you. there was a lot of meat in there uh you know i'm sure that there's going to be a lot of seg- you know we're going to break this into different segments sure um, and i'm sure there's, we're going to get a lot of them out of there so thank you so cool. much for being on anyone if you want to get yeah, in contact pleasure. with uh if you want to get in contact with john again show notes we're going to have all the information in there um reach out and he would uh, he and his team would be happy to to connect with you so Absolutely. Thank you so much, guys. This was a blast. I really had a lot of fun. Perfect. Thank you. And, Appreciate it, man. And, and yeah, last, have a great weekend. You too. And and lastly, Josh, we can't forget the disclosure. Uh, anything yep. we say cannot be taken as tax legal or financial advice. If anything did sound interesting, reach out to John. Reach out to your legal counsel, your uh, CPA, financial uh, uh, planner, and seek good counsel before making any decisions. Thanks so much yeah. for listening. And uh, yeah, have a great day. Yeah. Don't take don't take advice from a podcast. Yeah. <laughs>